The Sports Hot Seat is brought to you by Sport Buff, where you'll find the entire line of starter sportswear. Starter, now offering the most comprehensive 1-900 sports info and update line 24 hours a day. Welcome to the Sports Hot Seat. I'm Mitch Garber with Mitch Melnick, and today uh, we invite back someone who we've had a couple of times writing hockey on an almost daily basis, I guess, for the Montreal Gazette. And we'll talk a lot about hockey today with Pat Hickey. Welcome back, Pat. Thanks a lot, Mitch. How are you doing? Actually, it's the first time I'm with Pat. I yes, was at Fantasy that, Camp a year right, ago. That's you were at Fantasy Camp. And you were uh, sitting in this chair. It was like yep. a he was yep. a replacement host, I think, at that time. That's with right. With yeah, Pete Mahavlitz. That's right. right. Well, this, chair is, this chair is a little... Hotter. Those are the best shows. I think those are the best shows. Less we did. comfortable. That's <laughs> what I hear. I hear from, I hear from uh, many members of those the really uh, good Hickey shows. family, especially <laughs> yeah. who are regular viewers. No, the Hickey show. family don't watch this show. We don't. We don't get it. Out Where do you in, live? Uh, I live out in Eastern Townships, and this is not on our cable. Uh, never seen this show. I've never seen this show. Or heard, <laughs> or, or heard probably either of our radio shows. But yeah, I, he, I've, I've heard you. I've heard your radio shows a couple <laughs> of times. It's uh, the signal fades out around St. John St. Richelieu. You. Yeah, we're trying to do something about that signal. Yeah. We, we, yeah. we may turn to something illegal, but we're going to do something about that okay. signal. Okay, well, I'm, yeah. I'm glad to hear that. How long have you been writing hockey for the Gazette now, on a regular basis? Uh, about about three years, but if you... Uh, it's funny, when I first started doing it again, somebody called me a rookie, but I, uh, I dragged out some clippings. I covered, uh, for the Montreal Star, Jean Beliveau's 500th goal, Frank Mahavich's 500th goal. Oh, that Lou was a beauty, huh? Lou Nanny's only an HL hat trick. Uh, it's, uh, that was a historic night. That, Forget that was, about that the 500 was, that goals. That was an historic night. It certainly was. It was. Uh, in fact, there was also Dennis O'Brien's NHL debut, and the Minnesota North Stars beat the Canadians 6-5. But what year was that? 71, that was 71, 72, somewhere around there. So Lou Nanny must have kept people like you post game for about 40 minutes, the way he could talk. Uh, he he was great. I mean, it was uh, it was probably. Uh, it was probably the highlight of his career. Having, coming in here, beating the Canadians, it was a pretty good Canadians team. Uh, um, the North Stars were not, you know, were not a great team. They had a lot of guys who had played for the Canadians because of different trades that had been made. The Canadians used to dump a lot of their players in Minnesota and St. Louis. And uh, the guys came in here and uh, they brought this Dennis O'Brien in, who was a goon, and uh, had come in with great credentials. He had about 600 minutes in the Central Hockey League, and uh, that a was Garber his, favorite. That was his NHL debut, and uh, and he was very quiet. There was there was no, and uh, it turned out to be a, a shootout. And uh, Nanny had three goals, including the winner. So it was a, it was a big big night for him. Beliveau's 500th was a beauty. Frank's was not. And Frank's was not. No, uh, and and it was strange because the night that Beliveau scored his 500th. Uh, Red was working, was doing uh, hockey games on CFCF at the time, uh, on radio, and normally he would do, you know, most nights he would do the game and he would do his radio thing between periods, and this but one particular night he said, look, why don't you do the game tonight? And I said, well, what if something big, you know, what if Belleville gets his 500th goal? He said, well, he's got to get three of them tonight to, to get it, and that's what he did. He got a hat trick, and... Uh, and I remember going down to the dressing room and I said, well, do you want to do the story? He said, nah, kid, it's all yours. It's, uh, and, uh, Were you hoping he'd score three? No, I, actually, I, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't really thinking. Once he got, once he got the second one, <laughs> I said, boy, this would be great. You know, be here tonight. Jean gets his 500th goal. Can, and, uh, can you imagine anybody saying, hey, kid, to him? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> really? You keep, keep I, in was, mind. I was a little younger then. Keep in mind that uh, we're taping this show on Wednesday, March the 8th. And the Canadians, on this date, have lost five games in a row, and play tonight against the Sabres. Guarantee win forum. night. Guarantee win night. Win right. Forum tonight. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. as we get into the conversation about the recent. Lie low lines buying drinks if they don't win. It's. Uh... Well, lucky he doesn't have to buy steaks, <laughs> especially for Mike Keane. Mike Keane, right? So as we enter this conversation, the Canadians probably could have won three in a row, as unlikely as it might seem. Oh, or and everything could, is fine again. And everything's fine again. And this show is, you know, obsolete. <laughs> no one wants to watch it. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen. They have been playing. I mentioned to you the other night. They have been playing 
the worst hockey maybe in, in their modern history, especially that road trip that they took, the four-game road trip. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's the worst hockey in their in their modern history, but it's certainly pretty bad hockey. They uh, uh, they don't seem to be doing anything. They they haven't for the last four or five years. They haven't been able to score goals. They haven't been known as a high-scoring team. The thing that's particularly troublesome now is they're not playing good defense. If you look through the stats, the 20 games or so they played, you'll see that. In all but three or four of them, they've been outshot. And they've been outshot in some games by incredible margins, 53, 27. Uh, and this is just not the kind of hockey that the Canadians have, have been winning with. And uh, I think that's, a, that's more, more of a problem than, than what's happened to the offense. Uh, everybody keeps saying, you know, when are they going to score some goals? They've scored what, three goals, four goals in the last uh, five games. Now it's scored 24 to 4. That's, uh, that's pretty, uh, the 24. I think is a more troublesome number than the four. Well, it's, it's been a complete breakdown. All, yeah, all facets. They're, they're that, getting beat. Right. They're getting knocked off the puck. That's they're not playing. They're not scoring. They're get, they're not stopping anybody. The goaltending hasn't been strong Ron, Ron, as strong as Ron we're used Tug, to seeing. Ron Tug, that's been the better of the two goaltenders over this five-game stretch. He's played two games, and uh, uh, I don't think either goaltender has gotten a lot of support, though. I think that. Uh, um, Tugnut got beat with two goals in the game in Long Island, and in both cases, guys went, uh, they skated right up to him and, uh, and beat him. But when you do get a complete breakdown of a team, especially in this city, which is so st uh, used to success, then all of the inevitable rumors start, and we had the number one, what did you make of Rajon Tremblay's column as a fellow journalist, very well respected, uh, you know the kind of clout that he has in this province. Uh, the two columns that he wrote talking about the cancer on the team and then specifically targeting Matthew Schneider as the reason for the mm -hmm. Canadians' breakdown. Well, I, I think it, it was probably a little unfair to Matthew. Matthew has, not been, has not been, oh, well, let me see. Matthew has not been playing well. I don't, I think that he feels badly about it. I don't think that, I don't think it's affecting other players that much. I think everybody, everybody who is playing badly is playing badly because he has his or, you know, his own problems. And uh, you know, but Matthew has not been not been playing. Uh, How would you like it if the Montreal Gazette circulation stumbled and, dramatically, and, and you were on the I front page as, as the sole as reason cancer. for it? Well, well, first of all, he wasn't the sole reason. I mean, they mentioned other names, and uh, I thought it was interesting that all the names were English. Uh, Rajon's uh, politics, I think, are pretty well known. Uh, just a week before that, we had a. We had an article by Bert Raymond talking about how they were they were down to seven or eight French Canadians on the team, uh, and back in the glory days they had twelve. And uh, and what I think he he missed out on completely was the fact that the league has changed. And back in those days, every player who came up in the Quebec Junior Hockey League belonged to the Canadians. And for for a couple of years they had uh, the first choice of the of first two French Canadians in the draft. And it was certainly a lot easier to find French Canadian hockey players now. Everybody goes into the draft, and if you look closely around the league, French Canadian hockey players only constitute 10 percent of the players in the league, and uh, the Canadians have 33 percent of their roster. Well, they have know, more French Canadians than anybody else. Ronald Corey, in, but, that, in that Burt Raymond column, said that it still is the goal of the Canadians to attempt to draft and configure the team with a significant, not a, not a you, majority number, but a significant French presence. If, if you can get them, if you can get them, fine. I mean, if you look, if you look closely at the players around the league, though. And you look at the players that you would want to have on your team. Most of those players were drafted before the Canadians got a chance to draft. They're always drafting 20th, 19th, 20th. There are there are a couple of French they, Canadians out there, uh, Donald Odette and Benoit Hogue are two of them that were drafted quite late, and quite, the Canadians missed them. Quite late. And at the same time, uh, Patrick Watt was drafted in the third round. That's uh, you know the, the drafts a, the drafts are crapshoot. I mean, they certainly there are certainly guys who have been who have been overlooked. But, uh, well, you can't. I mean, you can't talk like that because then you talk about Brett Hall and others. But what you can do is, if your focus is on French Canadian players, and you've gotten to the second or third round, I think we'll all agree that some of the great hockey players come out of the third, fourth, fifth, or sixth round, and that's where your scouting talent really shines, or actually really looks pretty bad. If you're focusing by the third round on French Canadian talent, because if they do make it, you want it to be a French Canadian, and the rest of the league, as you very well pointed out the other day on, on the radio, Mitch, is looking in Russia and in Czechoslovakia and Finland and Sweden, and you're looking in Granby and in Lac Bopor, you're going to end up with a farm system 
that's not very good, even though they've got a francophone face on them. And I wonder if Canadians hockey fans care more about having French Canadians in Fredericton and some in Montreal than they do about winning hockey. And I think we're starting to see right now, they care more about winning hockey. And in Quebec, it's a great example. They care a lot more about winning hockey. Yeah, but I think it's important to have a French face to the Montreal Canadiens and, and the Quebec Nordiques. There's got to be a French face to it. I mean, that's... Well, you got Patrick Waugh. Uh, you know, you got Patrick well, Waugh. Well, uh, but, but maybe you won't have Patrick Waugh if this keeps up, right? I mean, you, I think there's, there's, you always have to juggle your lineup. You have to, you have to, find, you have to find French Canadian players. If you, I mean, they got Vincent Danfus back a couple of years ago in a, uh, in a trade. I think that, I think uh, what Mitch was saying about the, the later rounds of the draft, I think two years ago, for example, they picked Rajon Hul's son, uh, you know, late Jean in the draft, uh, I think his yeah. and I think they had one of Bordelot's kids. Uh, you know, these were these were obviously picks as favors to the fathers, and, and they missed the very kid. Maybe by the fifth or sixth round, you know that, uh, you know, they, they probably aren't counting that much. But you look at players. Gilbert Dion was signed as a free agent. Uh, Di Pietro was down the lower rounds. There are quite a few players on that roster who came in the lower rounds. The Canadians haven't gotten a decent first round pick in the last 10 years. Yeah, since 84. Um, Andrew, Andrew Cassells, I think, was the last one to play regular. Now we have Turner Stevenson. Uh, we've got one guy, Lindsey Vallis. Is, I mean, this is a year he should be, uh, fifth year pro hockey, he should be doing something. He's out of hockey altogether. Or maybe playing in Europe, but he's, he's not playing in Well, there's no America question they, they have, uh, they specifically targeted tough, big, slow they, players from out west for whatever reason to compete in the Adams division in the small rinks in Boston or Buffalo they felt that they were too small but for you know year after year after year they went that route and they, they haven't panned out none they, of them. They drafted them for Pat Burns I believe. I mean, well, Pat Burns was the coach when they drafted those players mm -hmm. that was the kind of player that he wanted that was the kind of team he wanted and uh, and I think the first year uh, Demers came and he said, uh, and they certainly did for the first half of the season, let's open things up a little bit. Let's try to get a little more offense, a little more scoring. Those aren't and, the players that can open things up. And those up, aren't though. the players who can open things up. I mean, you look at Turner Stevenson's been out there. I think he's played 13, 14 games. Nine or ten of them, he hasn't gotten a shot on that. He's a big, strong kid, and you'd think that you know, he'd be able to do something. But uh, uh, he works hard. He tries hard. But he just hasn't got this. And who are the best two the... teams in the old Adams division right now? It's Quebec and Buffalo. Two teams yeah. that are playing far more wide open, exciting hockey. Well, that, I, well I don't I don't know about Buffalo. Well, when, when LaFontaine Buffalo, comes back. When, when LaFontaine and Howard Chuck come back, maybe they will play a little bit. But I think John Muckler last year was was the coach of the year, did one of the best jobs ever. He lost Pat LaFontaine, uh, 50, 60, 70 goal scorer. He lost them, and they changed the whole makeup of that team. They went from a very freewheeling, you know, these, these are guys that would lose games 8-4 uh, or win games 9-0. Uh, doesn't hurt, you can't and, score on their goalie. And now, all of a sudden, they took a goaltender that had, had was a dismal failure in Chicago, Dominic Hasek, and uh, everybody said last year, you know, oh, gee, this guy's a fluke. You know, he, he stops, stops pucks, bounce off his back, uh, bounce off the back of his head. Uh, he does. You know, it's just a fluke. <laughs> he, he does. He He's does. He's got this I mean, weird the guy, style. The guy, the guy is down on the, uh, down the He's ice. Like all, this. Of a, all of a sudden, the uh, you know, hand goes up or the leg goes up, and <coughs> he makes a save, but <coughs> he's been doing it consistently now he's for two seasons. He's, he's a, a great goal. No question about it. <coughs> you all right? You're going to survive. I'm, I'm, I'm going to survive. There's only yes. 15 more minutes left. It's, uh, <laughs> no, but Buffalo, and, and you mentioned LaFontaine and Howard Chuck and throw in Mogilny. Mm -hmm. Immediately, you got three players who are better than anybody. Well, it's debatable, Howard Chuck, but certainly the top yep. two uh, than anybody on the Montreal Canadiens. Well, you, you got to play that style. I mean, I watched no I watched McGillney the other night, and you just you just look at this guy, and he's just he's just so smooth. He's uh, but the, the, the big thing is these guys figure out a way to get open, and you don't you just don't see that in the Canadians. Well, I'm you don't have sure. enough. Of, you don't have enough of those kind of guys. Um, you got four goal scorers on this team that have scored 20 goals in a season ever. That's right. Right? That's right. If you could think of the last Stanley Cup winning and team one, that had four 20 goal scorers in their yeah. career. Yeah. And I, one, I one of them is Matthew Snyder who's done it once. And you can't count on a, on a defenseman. You, Bobby Orr can count on to get 20 goals. But you can't count on a defenseman to score 20 goals every season. Um, so basically you have three guys. You have Muller, Danfus, and Bellows. And um, Recky. And Recky. So you got another guy. Well, Recky, that's, that's right. Yeah. 
But you, um, you've had a, you've had a team, a, a true team here in Montreal the last few years, and there's no question they've overachieved. And one of the reasons they've overachieved is because you had all units working together. Everybody was on the same page. Everybody did their little job, and all those little jobs added up to success. That's not happening now. Why is that not happening now? Well, I think that there's, I think that there's been a lot of, been a fair number of changes. They miss Guy Carboneau. Um, I, I think that's taken, and you look at some of the players who have come in and replaced them. I, Donald Brashear, I mean, it's a joke. I mean, three games on the, uh, on this recent trip, Donald Brashear's on the number one line. I'm, I'm sorry, the guy's just not, a, I mean, the guy is barely, is barely on this team, and he's playing on the number one line. There's something wrong. I'm not saying that he didn't deserve to be on the number one line, but it just means that there are a lot of other guys that aren't playing well. If he's the best you have to go on your number one line, then you got some problems. A guy, a guy said something very funny the other day, and it was very true. He said, you put Tampa Bay Lightning sweaters on the Montreal Canadiens, and they're the Tampa Bay Lightning. And it, it's very true. And it's very important, I think, for fans to, to realize this. They've got the Canadian sweaters on, but that doesn't mean they're the Canadians. Well, but in the past, that has meant a little, a little more than it, just any it, other sweater. It, prob it probably has meant a little more. I mean, you put a, you put a Canadian sweater on, and some, some ordinary hockey players became better than they were. Uh, I, don't know whether the, I don't know whether there's the same pride in being, in being part of the Montreal Canadiens that there used to be. I think there are a lot of guys that, that are not giving their full effort. And I think it starts with the defense. Uh, four or five years ago, it looked like the Canadians were going to have the best defense in hockey for a decade. There were young guys. Uh, um, and, and, and you look at them now, I mean, they're still pretty young. Uh, they're all 24, 25 years old. Uh, JJ's the oldest guy at uh, 29. And they haven't gotten any better. These guys have not gotten any better. And you can argue that in, in one or two cases, they've gotten a little worse. Schneider and Oderline this year are not playing well at all. And these guys both looked like they were, last year, they were coming into their own. Well, Schneider. the Canadians obviously felt it by trading Desjardins that Schneider was going to pick up his mm -hmm. game more than a yeah. notch, three mm -hmm. or four notches, and that Oderline would yeah. go back to what he was doing last year. He was right. emerging as one of the better defensemen right. in the league, and that Patrice Brisbane would step up and become the defenseman they thought he would be mm -hmm. when they drafted him high. And you're right, none of that has happened it's also as very, of March 8th. Yeah, it's also very rare, Mitch, in sports that 20 guys at the same time will all play their worst hockey. It rarely happens. You know, it doesn't even happen in basketball where you only have 11 guys. So here you've got 20 guys who collectively... Well, let's talk about the coach then. Well, let's talk about the coach. I'm, I'm wearing this jacket in, 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 with respect to Jacques Demers because in the face of all those who say, well, you've got to fire Jacques because he's not motivating the team to play. If these guys playing, like you just mentioned, with the red, white, and blue sweater on, making the money that they're making, playing the National Hockey League, losing games 7-0, 6-1, and 5-1, can't motivate themselves to win a hockey game, and can't play for Jacques Demers, Steve Schutt, and Jacques Laperriere. Don't get rid of Jacques Demers. There's a real big problem. And I, as a fan, I'd be prepared then to lose this season and not make the playoffs rather than fire Jacques Demers because these guys have no heart and soul. Well, that's because Jacques Demers sees you and says, you guys have a great show on, on no, 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 that's no, because, no, 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 no. <laughs> no that's, because Jacques Demers, that's because Jacques Demers, okay, I always believed you don't have to be a jerk and you don't have to be mean and you don't have to be tough to Sometimes be a good coach. Sometimes you have to be. Sometimes. You don't have to be. You can be smart about the game that you're coaching. You can have the team respect you and like you. You can be likable at the same time and it can work. Well, you don't have to be Vince Lombardi or Bear Bryant. And those are the two of the most successful coaches in the history of sport. All right, there's a lot to be said for the way those guys coached. But you don't have to be like that. Well, I, I, think, I, think, I think there are times when you have to, you know, you have to be able to crack the whip. And I think that sometimes when, when Jacques tries to get tough, uh, it just doesn't come across because he is, he is basically a pretty nice guy who wants everybody to like him. I think that's the key. Jacques wants to be liked. And... But at the same time, I, I, I don't believe that, that firing coaches is necessary. I, you know, it's possible that you get a coach and he's the, wrong, he's the wrong coach. But I don't think that if you have a guy who has been coach of the year twice, who has won a Stanley Cup here, I don't think he is the problem. I mean, he won a Stanley Cup with a team that Pat Burns couldn't win a Stanley Cup with. And two coach of the year honors back-to-back -back in yeah. Detroit with a team that didn't win the Stanley Cup. 
And, you know, I, I, mean, I want to say one thing about Jacques Demers, by the way. His relationship publicly with Patrick Waugh over the first 20 games of the season was nauseating. I have to believe that that will change now because he probably realizes that it, that it was so. The way he changed the lines up over the first 20 games, every shift was probably not good for the confidence of the players that were being shifted around on those lines. But those are mistakes that you can fix very easily without being fired. So I, th I, think that's, I think that's a major problem Jacques has is that he can't set a, 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 a three, at least three lines, stay with them, you know, throughout a game, throughout four or five games in a row, if you look at every team in the league, you can see. I mean, there's a crazy eight. I mean, Philadelphia has, hasn't made the playoffs in, in six years, but they stayed with the crazy eights, you know, for, for four years. And, and that line got better playing together. Now they made a change with Leclerc coming in there. And, By the uh, way, Jacques Demers a couple of years ago said that John Leclerc, in his mind, could one day be like Cam Neely. I, and we all laughed. And uh, now John LeClaire looks like Cam Neely, except not as tough. Yeah, he, he does. He, offensively, he looks like Cam Neely. He's, I, don't, I don't think he is as tough. I think that he may, he may be pretty close to Cam Neely as far as strength goes. And I think it's, I think it's the mental toughness. I think it's the ability to, to use that strength. That's, that's the difference between, uh, you know, Cam Neely is, is a nice guy off the ice, but when he gets on the ice, he, he has a mean streak. I mean, you know, he doesn't let anybody push him around. Lindros is just plain mean. And I think, you know, some of that can rub off on, uh, on John. John's basically a, you know, nice, easygoing, friendly guy. And it's the question of, you know, just getting a little bit of that toughness, getting a little bit of that edge. And I don't think there's ever been any doubt about John's physical skills. I mean, he's not a great skater, but he's an adequate skater. Um, Do you think people like Mitch give too much credit to the fact that Leclerc is playing with Lindros and there's a lot of open ice now for Leclerc? Or was he just about this talented and didn't have anyone close to Lindros to play with? Not that he didn't have a Lindros, I, because no one really does. But. I, I, don't think he, I don't think he had that. I don't think he had those kind of players to play with. What about ice time? Uh, what about confidence? What about? Uh, I, I think he got a fair bit of ice time here. He got a shot. And, and yeah, I think he, he did I think, get a shot. I think people I think people have confidence. And I, I look at some of the other players, and uh, you know I, I think that there's a there's a bunch of players, um, you know they, we, what I call the flavor of the month club, uh, bringing guys up from Fredericton or flavor of the week. Actually, they bring guys up. They play three four games. They're either back down or three or, four shifts, which is another uh, problem. You know Darby scores a. Uh, point in his first game and uh, gets a goal in his first game. Two day, two games later, he's down. Uh, 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 it was funny was they got Recky shortly after that, and and Jack Todd wrote a column saying, you know, you know, with Recky and now this brilliant young rookie Craig Darby, and uh, and of course Craig Darby's gone a week later. And now he's uh, back. Now you got Conroy. Now he's back. It's. Uh, you know, you get in a situation like that. Bure, uh, I didn't think he looked particularly good in his first game, but uh, Jacques, oh no, he, he did quite well. Liked, I thought he looked liked good the in that speed game. And, and things like that. And he looked, he looks, he looked out of place, Pat. He uh, had skill. I mean, exactly. here's a guy with natural skill, a great skater. Well, he's and a great. Sent, he was he's, fluid on the ice, great, unlike a lot of the Canadians. He's a, he's a great skater. He can, you know, but he doesn't really. You know, it, maybe that's the problem. Maybe he was too good for the guys he was playing with. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but you get in a situation. I said, well, Jack, uh, how long is he going to be here? And he said, well, I don't know. Well, you know, I think you have to make a commitment. And uh, if this you got to tell the guy you're going to play the, the next ten games, and that way the guy knows yeah. that he's not going back to Fredericton. So it all comes down to respect. I don't want uh, you know, based on what's been said, that I think Jacques Demers has to be fired. It's going to happen if if the team doesn't start winning. It happens in all of sports. It comes down to respect for whatever reason. It's it's not fair sometimes. It's not right. But if for whatever reasons the players, and you can blame the players, and that's an indictment of the players today, professional athletes, that's precisely what Mike Keenan and Pat Burns believe, exactly what you say. Mm -hmm. Players should be motivated themselves to work hard on every shift. And that's why when you see guys, why won't some guys get along with, with Keenan and Burns? What makes, does Keenan and Burns not like the way a guy looks? No, I know, I know and how they you get feel. Upset? If a guy can't play for Keenan or Burns, he can't play for you. I, I, know, I know you feel that way. If a guy can't play for, uh, you know, name another tough coach, uh, football coach or what have you, then he shouldn't be able to play for, for anybody. There are some coaches like Bill Parcells who reminds me more of Jacques Demers. He's not very tough, but he's quite sharp. 
uh, he's got the respect of his players, and they enjoy playing for him. And I would think, as a player, you'd really enjoy playing for Jacques Demers. What an enjoyable guy he must be to go to work for every day. What bothers me is to do a show like this for 30 minutes, and we still don't mention Serge Savard. Still don't mention but Serge Savard. But sometimes, okay. So there you go. Yeah, well, Serge Savard. I mean, here's before, a guy. Before we mention Serge Savard, can we just, go, <laughs> can we just get back to Jacques for a minute? Yes. I think that, you know, one of the interesting things, if you look at Jacques' record, and, and one of the things is that, you know, he, he's good for a couple of years somewhere, and, and then for some, whatever reason, things don't work out the way they do. And you get in a situation where... By the way, where, Pat Burns had the same record here. Year uh, after yeah, year after I, year, that's, it felt worse. That, that's right, you know, and, and Mike Keenan might have the answer. Win and leave. Win, leave. Yes. Have, uh, a, have a good Jimmy record Johnson. and then move on. <laughs> and then players move on. get tired of might, both methods. That might, that might be the – Keenan might have the right answer. It, may, right. Be, it may be time for Jacques to move on. Might but be at the same time, I'd like to see – if that's the case, I'd rather Jacques made the decision. I don't, I don't think he deserves to be fired. Oh, I, I, well, I, the guy who would fire him would be Serge Savard. So go ahead. I think we got about three minutes. All right, Serge? so Serge Savard, here's a guy who, in my estimation, has had a vision – of the Canadians, which has been tunnel vision. I mean, he's drafted all these big guys from out west. He has, ultimately, he's responsible for the team we have in Fredericton right now, the Canadians do. Not a very strong team, especially when you look at who they're calling up to the Montreal Canadiens. This slow defensive style has to be, I think, the blame, if there's any to be placed, placed on Serge Savard. You mentioned the Europeans. He missed every European in the draft from 1988 till now. The best European that's ever played here was Matt Naslin. Now he's playing in Boston. All of a sudden, he's back. I think he's missed the boat. He trades players because they've got a problem with their attitude, because they've got a problem with the coach, or a problem with each other. So he's, he's, he's reactionary. All he right, doesn't but what, trade but because coach, he sees... But when a coach says, ex, ex, I don't want this guy... You know, I, I will say that they have two great European players coming. Koivu and who's Koivu and Karpasov, who's a, uh, a Finnish defenseman. They are... I mean, I've watched them both in the Olympics. Koivu is going to surprise a lot of people. He's not very big. He's tough. He'll go out of the way to, go out of the way to hit people. And, but I think that they've started too late. I think that you're absolutely right. You look at all the Europeans in the league, you look at what they've done, particularly on the offensive style, and we've done nothing. All right, you know what? It's not so terrible if the Montreal Canadiens bought him out this year. I mean, I know it's, it's, it's difficult for some people to accept in this city. He's done but a good job. To not make the playoffs, in, 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 uh, to not m miss the playoffs mm -hmm. once in 40, 50 years, I mean, that's, if it happens, so what? I don't disagree with you. I think it's, it's time not, for a breath of fresh air in the GM's position. He's been there a long time. He's going he's to the Shadow right. Champlain. It's not going to happen. Right. It's not going to happen. Serge Savard is going to be here for as long as he wants to be here. Anyway, you know what? You'll catch more of this in the Gazette. You can catch Mitch weekdays at 4 o'clock on CIQC, and I'll be on uh, this show. Sunday night. <laughs> Sunday night. I don't plug myself. They know. <laughs> we'll see you next time on the Sports Hot Seat. The Sports Hot Seat is brought to you by Sport Buff, where you'll find the entire line of Starter Sportswear. Starter, now offering the most comprehensive 1-900 sports info and update line, 24 hours a day.
Welcome to the Sports Hot Seat. I'm Mitch Garber with Mitch Melnick, and uh, I guess the only way to introduce our guest is to say that there's no one manning the station right now. No one manning the radio station. There was a bomb. <laughs> one of these chairs. Here we go. Joe Cannon and Elliot Price from the CIQC Morning Show from the Joe Cannon Show. Don't Welcome. Bombs. <laughs> Not these days. There's too much of that stuff going on. <laughs> we don't have to use. We don't have to use bomb with the station in the same uh, in the same sentence. Well, there's that too. <laughs> We're the morning radio guys. Nice to be here. Thanks yeah. for inviting us. Nice to have you finally together. I know your schedules conflict. Yeah. But I have a uh, question. Yes? How come the hosts get to have makeup on and the guests? A few folks wonder why the guests always look so pale. We don't get makeup. What it's makeup? About, it's about right? the lipstick and the eyeliner. <laughs> <laughs> there are people, there are many people in television, males, who do wear lipstick and blush. There are many people. Name one. No. <laughs> no, because it will be a misleading statement. It's, okay. it's for well, the it, camera. It would be a lot more dangerous, I think, if people in radio wore lipstick, men in radio wore lipstick. That I would... can see we've really set the tone for the conversation for the next half hour. So, Mr. Cannon, yes, let's sir. start with you. Since I, I, this guy's been on, what, seven times, eight times? Uh, not now, recently, now, though. Now he walks down the street and people say, hey, you're on, uh, what, you're on... Uh... ESPN, too. <laughs> I feel like Charles Grodin. I guess you get my own show now, right? It's great to be on a sports show. I love this. You're, a, you're like a, what are you, a closet jock, a semi-jock, uh, what are you? I, I I'm not as much of a jock as I used to be. I uh, used to be totally enamored with sport, and like everyone else, I guess I've become a little bit turned off over the last couple of years. Most recently, of course, with the things you've been talking about, the that's baseball. All, no, that's the last couple of years? That's because you work with him. Oh, hey. is that it? Hey. Ah. No, I, I, I think Joe's more involved in sports than he's ever been before, but that has to do with partaking. Well, wait a minute. I ha I'll have you know partaking I was, I was once a play-by-play -play baseball announcer. Well, you don't want to tell that story. As, <laughs> as, you, as you are, I, I did a Pier two Pearson Cup games with Rich Griffin. I the wish, Rich, departed I Rich, wish Griffin. Rich was here to tell the story about one of those games. But I did a real game, too. I did a game with Dave Van Horn. Ellie doesn't remember this. I did a game with Dave Van Horn. Duke had to go back to California for either a wedding or a funeral, or three weddings at a funeral, whatever. And I uh, did a, a game with, uh, with Dave, and Dave said, look, Joe, you're going to do it just like Duke does it. You do the third inning and the seventh inning, and you'll do color the rest of the time. And everything was going fairly clickety-boo until the seventh inning, and the, the dreaded play, a bases-loaded triple. Oh, everybody's, <laughs> running. <laughs> everybody's running around, and I'm trying to describe it. and keep score at the same time, and Van Horn says, forget about the scorecard. Just tell them what's going on. Well, what is, what is the Rich Griffin story that he won't tell? I don't know. Something about... Uh, uh, I'm blushing. Went to commercial before the end of the game, or oh, I'm not sure exactly. Probably <laughs> there were so many screw ups in that. It was um, we had never done it. Neither one of us had ever done a play-by-play -play before of a baseball game, and we were doing it from Toronto, from Exhibition Stadium, I guess, at the time, and it was just unbelievable. I mean, it was a travesty. And thank God, Mike Boone must have missed it. <laughs> well, I won't now. <laughs> I have no tape of it either. I knew you guys would have probably wanted me to replay it for you. Today, be right? hey, they're making funny. What's your handicap? In golf? Yeah. 15. 15. Not Respectable handicap. But I have the worst swing in What's golf. What's your general handicap? <laughs> da -dum -dum. Okay. Well, there's that, yeah. yeah. Grew up, golf. You grew up with uh, Claude Brochu and... Oh, don't blame me for on. that now. I got a better one, though. I got a better one than Brochu. We'll get to Brochu. Okay. Patrick was... Mom. Yeah, Patrick was mom, Barbara Miller. Uh, she was a couple of years ahead of me in school. And... Uh, She's a former Quebec Carnival queen, wonderful woman. She, she's a, still a beautiful woman. She's a real estate agent in Quebec City, very successful. Barbara Miller, her maiden name, who married a man named Roy, as you may have noticed. So Patrick grew up in a, uh, in a household that was evidently dominated by French because Patrick's English has, has really improved over the last few years. But uh, she, you can see where he gets his athletic genes from. His dad, I'm told, is very athletic. And his mom was one of the early synchronized swimmers in Canada. They had a group up at the YMCA in Quebec City, Barbara Malafon, uh, Barbara Miller, and a number of others. They were one of the pioneers of that sport in Canada back ar ar around 1960. So Patrick comes by his athletic uh, ability very honestly. You still and speak to her pretty often? Oh, sure, yeah. She's good friends with my brother up in Quebec, and we certainly keep in contact. And Brochure as well. I met All right, Claude let's when, talk about yeah, Claude Brochure. I, I met Claude when I was 11 <laughs> years old in Quebec City. Uh, I had been living up in Cécile as a kid, and my dad died, and we, the family moved back to Quebec City. One of the first people I met in school was Claude. And uh, his family almost adopted me. I mean, I, I, I was at their house all the time. Claude and I became very good friends. And you know, Claude Brochure today is exactly the same as he was then. He was just as stubborn as a 10-year-old as he, as he is now with his baseball dispute. Once he makes up his mind about something, don't expect a whole lot of movement. So it's basically black and white. 
Is that how he views life? I, no, I, I don't think he views life in black and white, but I think he, uh, when he makes up his mind about something, he feels that he's looked at it from all sides and, and has made a decision based on fact. And uh, I know in this, he's certainly one of the hawks in this baseball dispute. And I've talked to Claude until I'm blue in the face about this. You see, I have single-handedly tried to solve this dispute for you guys. That's good. To, and you know, I'm, not a, I'm usually a fairly convincing guy, right? Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it hasn't worked. He thinks I'm nuts. But obviously, nothing. This whole dispute has not gotten in the way of your friendship, oh, despite not at that all, you work no. with uh, him. No, uh, not me. At all, no. I won't say you because no. you're fairly uh, easy. Yeah, well, non-controversial. No, I hear Mitch every day in, on in CIPC the, with his show, and I and I and I agree with most of. Uh, I think Mitch is a little dogmatic at times. So is Claude. I think somewhere in between, and obviously somewhere in between is where this thing is going to be solved. I mean. That, that's what bugs you in every labor dispute. It always gets solved, right? You know it's going to be solved. Someday there will be a solution. And you, you always wonder, logic dictates, why can't they solve it now? If you know they're going to solve it, why can't they solve it now? And this is what drives everybody crazy. I thought the best idea on that subject was uh, something I read in, uh, in uh, Baseball Weekly. A uh, guy wrote in a letter. He said, why don't they just take all the money... They, they, they keep playing baseball. You go back to where the strike started last August. You continue playing baseball, but every cent that comes in, instead of being divided uh, under the old plan by, by players and owners, it goes into escrow. And when it grows far enough that they have to decide that somebody's going to get this money, they'll find a way to divide it. And I thought that was a pretty good idea. Problem is, these guys are so distrustful of one another, they don't even trust escrow. And when you reach that point, you know you got a problem. <laughs> yeah, well, the owner's problem is they don't trust each other or the players. The players, of course, don't trust the owners. you got a big problem. There. I think the owners have come a long way. I mean, when this thing started, we were laughing at them. Everybody was laughing at them because every time one of these things has happened, they've caved in. And it's gotten to the point where uh, even if they were, like, completely 100% on the wrong side, it's really tough for them to give up at this point, having heard that for years and years. Oh, the owners will give in. <laughs> The owners will give in. They can't even stay together. They have stayed together. Right. This well, time. They, yeah, scrapped, yeah. they scrapped the season and the championship for a system that they will not get. Mm. They're trying to get as close to a well, salary cap as they can, well, but the fact is there will not be a salary cap. Okay, but wait a minute. Uh, we were told at the time that the players were going on strike uh, because the owners would implement their plan, which they did anyways after the World Series was canceled. So what have the players actually gained from shutting it down when they did instead of shutting it down right now? Why because couldn't they have Because it's the going to take longer season? than they anticipated, but they will not well, go leverage, back to leverage is also a major. Cap. Leverage yeah. is, a, is a very important right. part they of the puzzle. Right, they their leverage of the World Series, and they miscalculated. What about the owner, the the negotiating techniques? The owners have tried various moves in this thing. Selig being the latest, uh, a guy who, from what I gather, is a, is a really nice, bright guy who uh, wants but to solve this thing fairly. Do you ever notice when he meets the media <laughs> after a meeting? It takes forever for Bud Selig to... He's taking Paul Harvey lessons. <laughs> well, <laughs> Come up with what he wants to say. That's okay. But it has nothing to do with whether or not they think should be settled. Well, I just think there's a, there's a touch, there's a lot of drama in, in his approach and, I, and how he's trying I, I to think that it, you know, portray Joe, how negotiations But what about, what, what I want to ask you guys about, mm -hmm. both of you, and all of you, the three of you, you're all involved in baseball and, and various, what about fear, what about this guy? Well, you know, is, is it, maybe it's time that, that he took another approach to this thing. I really, I really question him. Well, in this it's a general as well. philosophy, Joe, is that the players think that uh, there shouldn't be a salary cap. Let yeah. the free market work as it should, and uh, a luxury tax at the amount that the owners are, are want is is akin to a salary cap. And I, I'm I'm sure like that people still don't get. It. I don't think they care. But, but they don't get it. Anybody who comes down on a player for this situation, and, and you keep hearing the same lines, these guys want more money. And that's not the case. They do not, they do not want, well, everybody yeah. wants more money, right. but they're not demanding more money. They'd be very happy with the system that they had last of year course. and to continue along in that. That's but they're, but they're even willing, yeah. but, they're, but they are willing to, to not play under last year's system. They prefer but, it, but they're, but the they're comments, willing to move a little the, bit. The comments from people are, it's, it's the players, mm -hmm. they want more money, and that's, that's simply not the case. Well, but I'm, it's also, a, isn't it, is it not a fact that the owners created the problem originally? I mean, the, the owners did give these salaries very willingly over the years, and they are now saying, okay, we created a problem, now we want you to help us solve the problem, or maybe do all of the solving. But 
and people say, well, that's not fair, but that's the way things work. I but, mean, we, look at Canada right now, the political structure in Canada right now. We did things, we all agreed that it was a wonderful way to do it, and now we're finding out that we can't really afford to do it that way anymore, so we've got to sit down and creatively find some new ways to run this country. And I, I gather that baseball, in a sense, is a microcosm of what everybody's facing, from Newt Gingrich in the States to, to Jean Chrétien here in Canada, to all of us with our social systems, to the way baseball's run. We're, it's, it's just a changing world, and we better get with it. The biggest problem, no doubt, was, was the salary arbitration, and that it forced owners to pay more money than they were willing. It wasn't only them going out and saying, oh, okay, we're going to get give them $6 million. It wasn't like that. What happened was you had a certain player play up to a certain capability, and if he made a certain amount of money, now you had the next guy coming in with stats that were better, and he said, well, he makes that much, I should make more. Now someone else who's a free agent with those stats is going to be asking even more. And I don't necessarily say you have to pay those kind of salaries, but the owners really got caught in a, in a catch-22, and it wasn't totally of their making. No, I, I agree. Make the I think everybody the, the arbitration uh, process was badly flawed, and it's a trade-off, four-year free agency, restricted mm -hmm. or not. I think that's a good trade-off, no more arbitration. I well, think the players are willing to go for that. How would my hero, Larry Sherry, have handled this situation? Larry Sherry. 1959 World Series Most Valuable Player. Norm's brother. Brother of Norm, yes. yes. Larry How would Sherry Larry have handled it? Why, why, I think we should bring Larry back and why see Larry. Why Larry Sherry? I don't know. His name just popped into my head. Well, why don't, we, why don't we talk about, for just a second, going back, yeah. all right? You go back to the owners having spent all this money and why the owners now want to revamp the system. The fundamental problem the owners have, if you look at the Chrysler situation, when Chrysler was in trouble, they closed plants, they tightened up, That's and right. Iacocca did a great job. In baseball, they want to do the same thing, but they're having expansion meetings as we speak about opening new plants. Bingo. Okay, new teams and, that are dying to pay big money right. to come into this business that is supposedly going down the drain. And also, during the strike, you have owners who sign guys like Kevin Gross to six million dollar contracts. Better well, example, San horrible. Francisco. The, when, the, when the ownership changed in San Francisco, maybe I'm wrong on this, as I remember it, the new ownership group in San Francisco said, we cannot pay more than a hundred million dollars for this to keep the baseball team in San Francisco. So the old ownership says, okay, and they made a deal, sort of like here. We'll make a deal, uh, give you some good terms, and they're crying poverty. We can't spend any more money than that. And literally within a week, sign a what, a 40, 40, 40 some million, million dollar deal? Million, and they made money on that deal. <laughs> but regardless of yeah. what you hear and what's told, they made money on that deal. They were not drawing in San Francisco, and all of a sudden they were a division leader, mm -hmm. and they filled the place at Candlestick Park. You went in the afternoon there when it, you, it's too cold or a lousy team. Well, it wasn't too cold, and they weren't a lousy team. And Barry Bonds helped put people in that they park. They also yeah. did a hell of a marketing job. They yep. surveyed fans on everything from hot yeah. dog wrappers wasn't just Bonds. To, to players. No, no, no. But that but helped. That, right. And they didn't use Leger and Leger either. a winner on the yeah. field. Yeah. Yeah. They've done some great off-season moves, too. The Giants have had Dusty Baker and the owner of the Giants and the GM of the Giants calling potential season ticket buyers and existing season ticket holders personally. Yeah, what's he telling them? That Bill Swift's not going to be here next year? Is he telling them that? Whatever he's telling is he them. telling them that uh, someone else has just left? Who's the, Portugal. Uh, Mark Portugal. There's someone else. Someone else in, uh, that they traded John Burkett because right. of his In salary. a bad situation, you'd rather get a phone call from Dusty Baker <laughs> than, you'd, than to get one not if he's mad from at me. Joe the Operator. <laughs> What's wrong with Joel the Operator? <laughs> well, he's not Dusty Baker, and he's asking you to spend a lot of money. I think it's a great idea. I think they're doing a hell of a job in San Fran. Yeah. I, I think it's basically about power, Joe, and the owners, uh, the they powerful know, of business people. Absolutely. They want to yeah. take back. The profits have been softening up, and they want to take it back. They want control of their game back. Yeah. These are people who have not lost often in their lives, uh, Joe and Elliot. These are guys who haven't paid a lot of taxes, who have gotten a lot of breaks from municipalities yeah. and cities and states and countries, uh, who deals have always usually gone their way. That's how they became very rich. Not absolutely. in baseball. Yeah, well. They should be used to it. No, they get rich out of baseball, right. and they get into baseball. It's and, tough for uh, you to tell an owner, you know, the George Steinbrenner, no, you can't do this. No, no one ever told him, no, you can't do there's something. There's no lack of people wanting to get into it. I mean, that's, no. see, that's, that's where it all breaks down, and you pointed this out, Mitch. Uh, you know, you can't make money in this business, but they're lined up to get franchises. You have a guy uh, who comes in and bails out Griffith in Vancouver, who, an American who now becomes the majority owner of an operation that involves a major league hockey team, the Canucks, a, a brand new NBA franchise, the Grizzlies. And, and, an arena, uh, arena. and an arena. Uh, and he wants to be there, obviously. The, the, the only franchise people who are hiding, of course, are the CFL people, but that's another story. <laughs> All right, let's talk.